but within this scrum guide, they basically laid out um, the three, five, three of scrum. Three, five, three. And so they said that in scrum, uh, there are three roles, five events or ceremonies, I E S and three artifacts. So the three roles are the PO or product owner, uh, the S M or scrum master, which is what you guys are all on track to be, or some of you guys already are. And then you've got the developers or dev team, some organizations call them engineers, some organizations call them different names, but uh, these are the people who actually do the work. These are like the smart guys, the coders, the testers, the QA guys. And normally they say a scrum team should be uh, six teams plus or minus three. I believe that was the number. So on the high end, you want a total team of about nine, on the low end, um, about three people on a scrum team, okay? And then you've got the five events or the ceremonies. And so the five events or ceremonies are the sprint, the daily stand-up or the daily scrum. You've got sprint planning. Sprint review and retrospective. And these are the same ceremonies that we will cover and go over in our program and we will simulate as well. And then the three artifacts, of course, we just talked about those three artifacts, but we've got the uh, product backlog, the sprint backlog, and then the product increment. Okay. And so right now I'm gonna dive in on our events or our ceremonies, okay? And so the first ceremony is the sprint itself, okay? And so the scrum guide says that the sprint is a time boxed event that um, should be, could be as short as one week up to four weeks or like one month. So a sprint should not, could not, ever be longer than one month, okay? And so I'm gonna draw this sprint um, in the form of like an egg. That's not a good looking egg, is it? Let me draw y'all a better egg than that. So if we talk about an egg, um, what are the parts of an egg? Somebody help me out. What are the parts of an egg? Shell. Ew. <laughs> what else we got? Yolk. What else we got? The egg whites. Okay. Anything else? Uh, membrane. Okay. So if I draw us an egg here. Although it may look like just one whole thing, there are actually at least four parts of an egg, right? Most people would just say three, but we got some science majors in the house, some biology majors, so we got the membrane too. We've got four parts, right? This is four in one. Just like if you're a Christian and we talk about the Holy Trinity, we've got three in one, okay? And so when I talk about the sprint, The sprint is actually five in one. Five in one. Because within the confines of this sprint, right? For example, in our program, we've got one week sprints. The length of this sprint is we're gonna say one week. Well, within this sprint, the other things that happen are the daily standup, DSU. The daily standup is a 15 minute time box event that happens every day of the sprint. 
this is an opportunity for the development team or the people doing the work to collaborate and to work together to talk about the progress towards the sprint goal, right? And what is the sprint goal? Well, in layman's terms, we can say that the sprint goal is everything that they've committed to in the sprint backlog. And so the daily standup is an opportunity for developers to say, hey, you know what? I'm struggling with this story that I committed to and I've got it in progress. I don't have all of the skills that I need to be able to do this. Or there's something that's missing. I need to ask some additional questions. Or I don't have, uh, I don't know how to code in that language. So I need to work with shells. So shells can help me complete that, right? That's what the daily standup is for. And so in our program, we have a daily standup at the beginning of every call for 15 minutes. We are simulating that ceremony that happens within the team, within the organization. So that's one of the five things that happens in here. Because remember, it's five and one. The next thing that happens in here within the sprint is sprint planning. So we'll say sprint planning. Planning happens at the beginning of every sprint. In our program, we do sprint planning on Monday. Sprint planning is when the development team sits with the product owner and plans what they're gonna complete for this current sprint. That's when they move the cards from the product backlog over into the sprint backlog. That is sprint planning. They are planning out their sprint to plan what they're going to do. When you take a trip across country, you plan your trip, but you gotta plan your trip before you leave, not after you leave. Because if you try to plan it after you leave, then you could get lost. You could wind up not knowing what you're doing. The trip is probably going to end up going a lot more crazy than it could have gone had you planned it out to some extent. And you don't have to plan it out 100%, 1,000%. You don't have to know with 100% accuracy exactly every single thing you're going to do on every single day of the trip. But maybe you got a rough outline, right? and you refine and you work on it as you go on, right? You say, you know what? We're gonna do these three or four or five stories this sprint. We got a couple more questions that we need to ask about this specific story, but we have enough detail up here that as we work, we can add a little bit more detail down here in the story. But we have enough information to be able to start working right now. And so that's what happens during sprint planning. We are planning the work that we are gonna complete for the sprint and committing to it. The next ceremony or event that happens during uh, a sprint is called the sprint review. And in our program, we do that on Fridays. And this is where we review the work that you've done. You have to come and demo the work that you've done. So if you tell me that you made a mobile app for a cell phone and you say that on this mobile app, we can log in and do these things in the sprint review, we're going to review all the work that we completed and hopefully the work that didn't get completed. Hopefully there is none of that, but we're going to expect a demonstration for you where you demo this calculator app that you've just created. You literally pull it up and you share your screen and you show us that it's working. We don't want to see screenshots. We don't want to see a PowerPoint presentation. We don't want to see a video recording. We want to see the actual app, the actual program, the actual feature working. If you tell me that now you've added a, uh, a camera on the front of the phone and now I can log into my camera app and I can hit this button in the bottom right-hand corner and it's gonna flip the camera to face me. And now I can take a selfie by holding my phone out and doing this. You need to come in and actually take a selfie on the phone and show us that it works. Because that's the only way that our stakeholders or our product owner can see and test and understand that you have actually completed this to the specifications that they've asked for in the user story. That is sprint review. There are a few other things that probably should happen in sprint review, but we'll get to those when you guys get close to actually working and getting ready to start interview. Um, after the sprint review, we also have the sprint retrospective, also known as the retro, R-E-T-R-O. And this is where we, go ahead, Lashante. Yeah, I, I just, I typed it in the group. So um, I started my position this week and one of my teams is a Kanban team. Mm -hmm. Do Kanban teams that work more on like tickets, you know, they're really kind of just doing, um, you know, uh, fixes and um, work. do that. Yeah. Do they do, do they do demos on the work, you know, on things that they've, you know, that they were supposed to update and correct? 
Like if there was some error with some website or something? So usually not, I'm going to say no, um, usually not. But if they're doing some hybrid, like Scrum Bond, where they're doing a little bit of Scrum and a little bit of Kanban, they may have demos. But for the most part, because the work that Kanban teams do is so repetitive, there's not a need to demo it. Because literally every week, you're going to be showing me that you put a seat, uh, four tires, and painted a car and I'm gonna have to look at a hundred cars. That's the exact same thing every single time. So usually they don't demo, but depending on, on the, the bug that they're fixing, maybe it's like a, a really big bug that's been plaguing the company for years or months. And finally you guys fixed it. Maybe it's a big deal that you fixed it and we want to see it in action. So we might demo it. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. No I have problem. some input on that. Real question. I have some input ahead, on that real quick. So I have an XP team. And I also have a scrum bond team, so a team that uses both uh, frameworks. And in my opinion, all teams use both frameworks, but that's another discussion. <laughs> but um, they're officially part of scrum bond team, and we do not have what you would consider traditional sprint reviews in front of stakeholders and users. Um, we we would have a 10, maybe 15 minute sprint review with the product owner and maybe with some other content managers. And I give you some quick context of the work we're delivering. We're delivering on a public facing website that you can actually go to and look up. And so a lot of the changes are small changes. We're, we're just getting to like big, huge functionality changes, like adding a, adding a caching functionality, for example, or something like that. So like Victor said, a lot of the work we do is pretty easy. Doesn't really take like a huge audience doesn't really take a large conversation. Testing effort is even pretty easy. So whether it's changing the color of a banner, um, increasing the size of a video, um, increasing the size of maybe a thumbnail, making sure that the mobile reflects what it needs to properly. Because just because it reflects properly in Internet Explorer doesn't mean it reflects properly on your phone. So small changes like that. So no, we don't have what you would consider traditional sprint reviews on that team. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Thank you for that breakdown, Val. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right. Um, what was I going? Retrospective, right? So retrospective is the ceremony of the event where we look back in retrospective at how we worked as a team, right? So review is where we look at what we worked on as a team and we scrutinize the work that we did or our product owners or stakeholders scrutinize and say, hey, that button was supposed to be light green. You made it hunter green, right? hey, the button was supposed to send this document to that email when they hit enter. Why did you send it to this database, right? This is where we can scrutinize the work that gets done. And the sprint review is open to usually anybody in the company can come and attend a sprint review. It's kind of like a bazaar. It's kind of like show and tell. It's kind of like a invention convention when you were a kid. Everybody gets to put the work that they did on display and be like, look, look at it. We made the button. Yes, it's fine. Push the button. We'll we'll walk you through pushing the button and you can see exactly what it does. That's what sprint review is like. Retrospective is like the locker room after a basketball game or a football game or a volleyball game. This is where just the core team, right? Who's on the core team? Remind me. Who are the three parts of the core team? Product owner, scrum master, and devs team. Perfect. This is where the core team, the core scrum team comes together and talks about how we worked as a unit. How did we work this week or this sprint? How did we communicate? How did we collaborate? Are there any process improvements in the way we did what we did that will allow us to be more effective and efficient next week or next sprint? Um, so Tisha, I need you to send me an email on day one when you have an impediment and you can't move one story from in progress to done, right? Don't wait three days before you alert me. Uh, Samantha, I need you to send me an IM, call me and email me if there's an impediment and I don't get back to you after you IM me, right? I need you to contact me every single way you can. Uh, Jojo, I need you to speak up during daily stand up and let us know if you need help collaborating with someone, right? Don't wait till the last day of the sprint to ask for that help and then we can deliver it, right? Let's discuss during our sprint retrospective how we worked as a team. I'm gonna write it down below it, how. 
and I'm going to write what under review, but let's discuss how we worked in our retro as a team. And if there's any conflict or, or we need to upgrade our team working agreement or our ways of working agreement, let's discuss that here. Just like teams may fight in the locker room about someone missing a shot or someone throwing bad passes or someone uh, pitching too slow or not serving up the volley in volleyball. Let's talk about that and have that conflict privately as a family in our sprint retro. In our retrospective, we will come up with ways that we want to improve for the next sprint. What are the action items that we're going to take out of our retrospective and pull with us into the next sprint so that we can deliver better, so that we can deliver faster, so that we can be a stronger, more cohesive team? And these are the five original ceremonies or events that happen in a sprint. One, the sprint itself, which is everything. And the sprint doesn't end until all of these other events have ended. Well, technically, the sprint is time box. So the sprint ends when the sprint ends. But within the confines of that time box, all of these other things have to happen. We've got the sprint. We've got the daily stand up. We've got sprint planning. We've got review. And we've got retrospective as number five. You can also think about it like a football game. Within a football game, what happens? Well, for a football game to be a football game, you got to have the coin toss, you got to have kickoff, you got to have the first quarter, second quarter, halftime, third quarter, fourth quarter. All of these things happen within a game. And it's not really a game if you don't have all of these things. Same way with the sprint. All of these things happen within a sprint, and it's not a sprint if you're not having any stand ups, or you're not having a retro, or you're not having a review. It's not a true sprint because you haven't satisfied all of the events that happen within the sprint. Time box. Any questions about the main five ceremonies that take place within a sprint or commentary? Checking the chat, checking the chat, okay. So if no questions there, we're gonna talk about the bonus event or the sixth event that um, is mentioned in the scrum guide, but isn't really mentioned as part of the 353. And that's going to be refinement. Refinement. So refinement is a ceremony where the team and usually hopefully the product owner work together to add detail to the story, add requirements, potentially add acceptance criteria, but really just have a conversation around getting an understanding of what exactly needs to be done. And we'll go into detail about that here in a moment, but Robert, was there a specific question that you had about uh, refinements? It wasn't a specific question. I just remember when I was um, at this step or we did this lesson when I first started the program, I think it was Karen who had brought up refinement and I wasn't there yet. So it didn't make sense, you know, how different people are at different points. And so mm -hmm. now I think I, I grasp it a lot more because I, I understand a lot more what's going on with with just the scrum process and ceremony. So, so I just thought it was a good point to bring it back Perfect. into the lesson. Perfect. Not a problem. So refinement. <clears throat> Remember, we've got this product owner that's making this list, if we can find this list of stuff, right? They got this product backlog and they've got over a hundred items in the backlog. Well, they are usually only gonna have enough work at the top of the backlog that's been refined, which means it has all of the detail that you need to do the work. But usually once you get deeper in the backlog, the stories have less and less detail because the team is not gonna be working on them in the near future. The team is actually gonna be working on those in the far future. So my time is more valuably spent working at the top of the backlog on the stuff that they're gonna pull this sprint or next sprint versus something that they're gonna pull in six months or three months. And so there is a refinement session or story or ceremony that should be happening constantly during every sprint. Most organizations or most teams that I've been on usually have at least one refinement session, a sprint. Normally it's like 
one to two, maybe three hours. Sometimes they have them twice a week. Sometimes they're having them two, three times a week, just depending on how many stories they need to refine and how much work the team is getting through. And so during a refinement session, we may pull a story in and say, hey, team, we're going to refine this story as a unit. So let me see. I'm going to talk about NOSA because I know, I know what NOSA does. I know what she used to do in her former life, right? She's an event planner, right? And so if you're planning an event or a wedding planner, if you're planning a wedding and the bride and groom say, I want flowers at my wedding. Okay, flowers, we'll, we'll, we'll write that down. I, I understand that you want flowers at your wedding. Well, no, so what is the problem with one of your clients just saying they want flowers at their wedding? Is that enough information for you to go and execute on getting them flowers for their wedding? Absolutely not. What kind of flowers? Real flowers? Okay. Silk? What, 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 what brand are we talking about? And what, what, what season are we in? And even if it's real, what type of real flowers? Right. So those are just a few of the questions that a wedding a planner would have to ask. What kind do you want? Roses? Do you want lilies? Do you want tulips? Do you want daisies? Do you want, I don't know, no other kind of flowers. That's it, right? But I'm sure it's hundreds of them, or thousands of them. And after we talk about the kind, do you want real flowers or do you want faux flowers? Whole different conversation. Do you want silk flowers or do you want, I don't know, cotton flowers? I don't know what other type of material flowers are made of. And if they pick something that's not in season, now you got to have a tough conversation. Hey, those flowers don't bloom in this season that you're having your wedding. We've got to pick from these kind of flowers. And that's a real conversation that developers have to have, right? Because sometimes product owners, just like brides and grooms, may have unrealistic expectations based on the resources that are available to them, right? And then even after you figure out the season, now you've got to talk about type again, right? And we haven't even talked about the color, right? That's another thing that you got to discuss. What color do you want your flowers? And so all of these are things that would come out in a refinement session with a product owner and a development team because the people who are executing or will say Nosa, who's the developer in this situation, she's executing. She knows that flowers isn't enough information for me to do what I got to do to your liking. Because I know you've probably got something very specific in mind. So we need to do some additional refinement. And guess what? Even after you give me all of this information, there's another question that even trumps all of those questions. Y'all know what that is? Budget. What is your budget? How much money do you have? Because you might have gave me all the answers and you tell me that your budget for flowers is $450. And what's Nosa going to say to that? Goodbye. You're going to get what you're going to get. Whatever the venue is going to throw in for us, that's what y'all going to get. But y'all probably don't really have a budget. We might have a budget for the bride's bouquet, and maybe we can do some real small for the uh, maid of honor, right? And that's a conversation that the development team has to have with the product owner. Or if we say, like, yo, these flowers are not in season, but you know what? We can import them from Madagascar. But the lead time on importing flowers from Madagascar is six months. Well, if your wedding is in three months, that's not an option anymore. We got to do something different, right? And so if the development team says, well, if you want us to design this new cell phone, this iPhone 27 that you want, the lead time on glass from China and manufacturing is... Uh, 24 to 48 months. And so if we want to release a phone in 18 months, we need to pick a different type of glass. We can't have that shatterproof gorilla glass. We need something different. Go ahead, Kiana. I was going to ask, is the is the product owner in charge of budget and uh, monitoring things like lead time? Or is there like a project manager on the team as well that are that's handling those sorts of things? Great question. So within Scrum, the only three roles that are recognized are the Scrum Master, 
the product owner and the dev team. The role of a product project manager is not recognized in Scrum specifically. However, based on the organizational structure of the company you're at, there may be a product owner floating out here somewhere that you have to do some type of coordination with. And the way that coordination is going to happen is going to be totally dependent on your organization and how they operate. Sometimes there will be a product on, a project manager that can approve budget and is responsible for lead time and lag time. Sometimes the product owner is inserted as part of not necessarily the development team, but maybe a hybrid somewhere between product owner and scrum master. Sometimes some organizations will want the scrum master to wear two hats, dual hats, of product owner, uh, of project manager and scrum master. Some organizations I've seen the product owner uh, kind of wearing those dual hats, but it just depends. But if we're talking about traditional vanilla scrum, which is what I like to teach you guys in this class before we get to all of the twists, there is no role of product owner, uh, I'm sorry, project manager in scrum. And it is the product owner's responsibility to coordinate with external stakeholders because again remember the product owner doesn't actually do any coding or development work so their sole job is to talk to customers to get feedback on the product and the customer's needs their sole responsibility is to talk to stakeholders and usually those stakeholders that they are in communication with are the ones who control the budgets. So it's the product owner's responsibility to coordinate that outside the team. But the development team may be the ones to say, hey, that work you want us to do, that's work that's going to take us eight weeks. Based on the, the staff that we've got on this team, it's going to take us eight weeks to do that. So if you need that in two weeks, we can't do it. We need to bring in some additional resources. And so now maybe the product owner needs to go to their stakeholders and ask for additional budget approval to bring in additional headcount for X, Y, D, C, days, weeks, months, years to get this project or product released on time. Great, thank you. No problem. Good question. So Zena uh, or Kiana, I see somebody maybe coming on or off mute. One of y'all got a question for me? Okay, um, so back to refinement, right? I don't even remember where we were refining at. We were refining somewhere. But um, so refinement is adding that additional detail to the story, asking those questions that need to be asked, finding out that additional information so that the product team, the development team, the people doing the work can do it. Let me put it in a different language, right? Bab has dropped the line. He's not here anymore. But my mom has a really bad habit of calling me and my brother and even my sister to come over and do stuff for her, right? Or to do like stuff. So she'll be like, hey, I've got, um, I got this couch. I ordered a couch and they delivered it and it's in a garage. Can you bring it in the house and set it up in, in the room for me? I would be like, okay, me and Bab will coordinate. Hey, I can be over there at this time. You'd be over there at that time. We, we got a moving company. We, we've, we've moved in a previous life. So this should take us like 20 minutes maybe to do, right? Knock it out and get back home. No biggie. We get to the house. And not only is there a couch there, but there's also like a dining room table. There's a whole like uh, king size bed with the mattress box frame and, and, and frame that we have to assemble. Um, she's also had like a new refrigerator. Uh, delivered this also in there and we looking at all of this work like you want us to put all of this in the house today like I have a date in like 45 minutes I was just coming over here to just pop in and just help out real quick right and so she has this habit of giving us a story that she wants us to complete but not giving us all of the additional acceptance criteria that go with it because had we known that these were also going to be required or requested from us we wouldn't have said we could do it today at 7 p.m i would have said mama let's wait till saturday when i got my full day free and i can do all of it 
right? And so it's important really for us as the children, now that we know our parents, but also for the development team who's gonna be doing the work to get to ask all of these questions so that they can clarify what is really being asked. Because in one person's mind, they see this, or they believe that this is what's being asked. But then the other person's mind is something totally different. They're, they're describing or asking for something totally different. And so really the refinement is an opportunity for um, the team to have a conversation with the person asking for the thing, and for us to have a shared understanding of what it is and what it's gonna take to, to deliver it. And that's really what refinement is. Robert, you had a question or comment? Yeah, I do. Um, so using your your mom's and uh, your sibling's situation, tying it to the real scrum process, mm -hmm. does refinement happen organically? Like, just like you show up to the house and you see a million pieces of furniture in the garage or as a team, do you kind of have a time or just like with you and your family, you know, no matter what your mom says is going to be the case that it's going to be a whole different situation. So you plan, hey, bad, before we go over there, let's figure out a time because you know it's going to be way more stuff than what she say. So let's kind of figure out a time we got a bigger window open and whatever she's talking about. Like, is it, how does it happen? So for my mama, yes, that is what we should do. We should ask a lot of questions in advance and plan additional time on the front and back end because we just know when we get over there, it's going to be something, right? Uh, however, on a scrum team, it should happen organically, but it should be planned because if we look at the ceremonies that happen during a sprint, and let's just say that our sprint is going to start on, we'll say, a Tuesday, right? This is gonna put day one for a 14 day sprint. This is a two week sprint. And then actually, you know what? Let me put start and let me put stop. So the sprint is going to start here and the sprint is going to end. No, it starts there, then it's gonna end. So we need to start on a Wednesday. I'm gonna give y'all a, a cheat code real quick. It's better to not start a sprint on a Monday. Does anybody know why it's not great to start a sprint on a Monday and end a sprint on a Friday? Because if you started here, this would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This would be day 10. So the sprint would end here. So demo retro review would happen there. Does anybody know who's not working? Um, why it's not a great idea to start or stop a sprint on a Monday and a Friday? A majority of public holidays usually say, fall. Go ahead. I would say we might have some offshore teams um, that the time zone are not the same. And as Elia said, some um, holidays falls on the weekend that we have to take the Monday off. Absolutely, right? So, same thing even for people onshore. Majority of public holidays, at least in America and even probably in other countries, fall on a Monday or Friday. So normally that's how people have three or four day weekends, right? Memorial Day, like on a Monday. So now we get off Friday, nobody's working Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Usually a lot of people will also take off like the day before or after the holiday as well. So um, you could have during sprint planning, a lot of people on your team not there or during refinement and retro, again, a lot of people not there. So that's why it's a bit better to start in the middle of the sprint. So well, in the middle of the week. So if we start on a Saturday, if we start our sprint on a Wednesday, then that means it's going to end on the following Tuesday. It still gives us the same number of, of, um, of days in a sprint and not necessarily would it end on this sprint because this would be one day, two day, three day, four day, five, six, seven, eight. And then if we had another week down here it will be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then we go to day nine and day 10. So the sprint would technically end here. If we started in the middle of this week, okay? Are y'all with me? Y'all following me still? 
Oh, y'all can't see that. There we go. Does that make sense? Can y'all see what I'm saying? Does that make sense for y'all? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay. Okay, cool. So first day of the sprint. Bang. We're going to do, and I'm going to use abbreviations. First day of the sprint, we're going to do sprint planning, SP. And then because it's the first day of sprint, we may or we may not do a daily stand-up, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and put it. I'm going to put DSU, daily stand-up. Then on day two, we're going to do daily stand-up. Day three, we're going to do what? Daily stand-up. Daily stand-up. Day four. Daily stand-up. Day five. Daily stand-up. Day six. Day yeah. We're going to say DSU on day nine. And then what are we going to do on day 10? Retro. DSU. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Retro. And review. And again, some teams may cancel the daily stand up on the first day and the last day of the sprint. That's not uncommon. So, kind of not a big deal. You can kind of judge your team and see whether or not they need it, right? So we were talking about refinement originally and when does that happen or how do we schedule it? Well, it should happen regularly during the sprint. It should be an ongoing recurring meeting. And so what I've seen that some teams might do is they'll say, okay, every Wednesday or every Thursday and Wednesday, we're going to have refinement. So we will say on Thursday, we're going to have a refinement. On Tuesdays and Thursdays are going to be our refinement when we're not on the week of a sprint, or as long as it does not uh, clash with um, our uh, sprint days. So we would not refine on this day because we've got the retro review on that day, and usually those are pretty busy days. So on this sprint, how many days did we have a refinement session? Three days. Three days. So every three days of these, so three days out of every sprint, we're going to do a one hour refinement session. So this is going to happen consistently. And this is usually the best way to do it. Have a good night, Jamie. And this is usually a good way to do it because you, you built up a regular cadence, you built up a regular schedule, and you're not having it just willy nilly when you feel like you need it you're having it consistently. I'd rather have it on the schedule. And if we don't need to refine, if we've got enough stories refined already, then we can cut it short. But I at least like to have the meeting on the calendar because it makes it easy for everybody. Does that answer your question, Robert? I know it was a long way to get there. No, that's, that's exactly what I was looking for. That, that was perfect. Okay, good stuff. Um, that is going to close out the lesson for tonight. That's, that's all I'm going to talk about tonight. So I do want to give you guys a little bit of time to see if you've got any questions. I know we covered a lot of information, a lot of content tonight. I appreciate y'all for hanging in there with us tonight. We went, what, two hours. So what questions, if any, do y'all have about really anything that we've covered this evening? I have a question about refinement and I might've missed this part. Who Sure. Um, who all would be involved in that ceremony? So, so the development team is going to be there because they're the ones doing the work. So they need to ask the questions. The product owner usually is going to be there as well because they're the ones who have asked for this thing and usually have talked to the stakeholders. Where, where do we diagram our stakeholders that the product owners are talking to? They've talked to the customers and stakeholders firsthand. So they know what it is those customers and stakeholders want. So usually the product owner is going to be there. If the product owner can't explain it well enough for self or doesn't have a good grasp of it themselves or just haven't had time to dive into it, they could invite some of these stakeholders or customers. And when I say customers, customers aren't always external people or people who are going to the register at the store and purchasing something. Within the organization, you've got customers too. So I used to work for Toyota. I worked in the IT department and our customers we're literally everybody within Toyota because we managed Microsoft Teams. So anybody in the company he used, who used Skype for business or Microsoft Teams for messaging or communication or for calls, which is literally everybody because that was a tool that we had, they were our customers. And so we had to listen to our customers' complaints 
and help resolve those complaints when they came up. So stakeholders and customers are going to be usually the people who the product owner is talking to and getting information from that's going to help create the work that the team is going to do. So if needed, they could pull those people into those meetings to give that additional detail and answer the questions that the product owner may not have. Um, usually that's going to be about, oh, the scrum master as well is going to be in there um, to help facilitate, to ask questions, to make sure that both sides understand. Sometimes when you have business people, which are usually customer stakeholders and product owner talking to technical people, which are the developers, they don't always speak the same language. Uh, normally the business likes to talk in terms of dollars and cents and money and impact. Developers talk in like coded language and jargon. And so sometimes as a scrum master, we just need to be there to make sure that both parties are asking the right questions and understand what um, the other side is saying and trying to communicate. So the entire scrum team should, should usually be there. Developers, scrum master, product owner, and any additional stakeholders who may be able to answer the questions that the product owner can't about what it is that they want implemented. Sometimes it can be a little bit difficult because we're playing the telephone game with these stakeholders and customers sometimes if they're working in a silo. You all remember the telephone game? Anybody? Yes? Yeah. No? Maybe. You got a kid standing over here with uh, a cup to their ear. I can't draw a cup, man. Why y'all making me draw tonight? Um, we got a cup, right? Boom, boom, boom. And then there's a string going all the way over to someone else. Or is this even the telephone game? No, this ain't the telephone game. No, that's not the this. telephone game. I'm not quite sure what that is. All right, the telephone game. You've got one kid. I call random people. Oh, you no, no. you talking about being a bad kid. You, you, <laughs> my plan on, you talking about playing on the phone. You, you can do this with charades better than you could with pictures. So you got one person that is listening and you got another person that is talking to them, right? And so after this person tells this person something, now this person is going to come over here and tell this person that same thing, right? Okay. And now this person is going to tell this person what they were told, right? And so the problem with the telephone game is usually the person at the end of the line doesn't hear the exact same message that the first person told the person they were talking to because stuff gets lost in translation. People say things differently. People have different cadences. People forget stuff. So you might have a stakeholder and so let me diagram this out. So we have a stakeholder, or let me say it's a customer. So we have a customer that told our product owner something at a meeting that happened four or five, six days ago. And now the product owner has to come to refinement and tell the development team. And now the development team makes this thing and we're here at the end of the sprint i'm going to say end of sprint and now we're presenting this in our sprint review and the they demo it and the customer is there and guess what the customer says they looking like what the hell is that mm -mm. What, what, what 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 does al make who, who asked for that I I ain't, ask, I ain't ask for that. We, we ain't ask for that. My stakeholders, we ain't want that. That ain't, that is not what we told the product owner. So now we got to be like, okay, well, dang, what, what did y'all tell the product owner? We said this and this and that. And the product owner be like, dang, I forgot. I th ain't that what I told y'all? That's what I, that's what I said, ain't it? Hell no, that ain't what you told us. <laughs> <laughs> And this is when there's only one layer removed, right? Sometimes the customer or sometimes a stakeholder is getting the information from the customer. So sometimes we have the customer right here and they told the stakeholder and then the stakeholder told the product owner and then the product owner told the team and then the team did it. And now we come back. So every line of removal that you take from uh, being the person with the information, it's going to get warped and twisted just a little bit. 
And so that's why it's really important. And, and in Scrum, we push that like, whenever possible, we want to invite these people in to have this conversation with the dev team. The people who want the stuff need to come and talk to the people who are doing the stuff. Because otherwise, stuff can get lost in translation too easily. And we can end up wasting our time during the sprint working on something and delivering something that wasn't what was really asked for, or what was needed, or, or that's not valuable. That's a good question, though. 